know what? It's topical. Come on. All right, here we go. This is Stephen Heath, and this is Why Am I Surrounded by Friggin' Idiots? All righty. Well, as he said, uh, my name is uh, Stephen Heath. Uh, this talk is titled, Why Must I Be Surrounded by Friggin' Idiots? And the answer to that question is because you probably hired them if you're in a position like I am. So to, to sort of start off, I, I want to give you guys just a bit of background about me. Um, I work for a small consulting firm up in Spokane, Washington. I work as a director of security services, master's degree in computer science, too many certs, and I know that doesn't really mean crap, but, uh, you know, they asked for it on RFP, so I got to do them. Um, worked in IT for over 10 years. Uh, I run a team of secult, uh, security consultants, analysts, two-year-old son you see in the picture, Seattle sports fanatic, as you can see from what I'm wearing, and I'm a serious nerd, and that picture should pretty much prove that. Um, the reason I'm going over all of this is... <laughs> Nothing that I have in my background prepared me at all for having to be a manager, having to hire people, having to bring people in, build a team. I mean, I started out as a technical guy, worked as a pen tester, you know, occasionally doing a little bit of audit, kind of getting into that realm, doing that. You know, started out as a small consulting firm. I was employee five. We have 35 now. You know, grew up, have a team of about six, seven guys. I have to run, manage all the time. And, you know, really didn't have any particular knowledge or experience that really gave me a good picture of how to hire people and, you know, what to do. And so that was kind of what the, the, the genesis of this talk was, well, I, I you know, at, at groups like this, I, there are other people here that have gone through the same story. I mean, you're, we're all technical people for the most part here. That's what we do for a living. That's what we want to do. So when we end up in this position, we have to be able to build a good team. And so, you know, I really looked at, okay, this, this is how, how, uh, I've been hiring, you know, pretty much in 12 steps. It was, okay, so, you know, somebody quits or you have to fire somebody, fine. So I have a position open. Okay, well, then I panic. Uh, sh you know, I, I need to get someone in there right now. Uh, dust off that job description that HR makes you have. You know, take a look at it go, uh, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, you know, we post it online. We'll find uh, Monster or Dice.com. That's a great place. Let's put it there. Uh, then then we, we look at some resumes uh, and we... Pick about three that don't suck terribly. Um, you know, we, we go in, we get an interview, and we ask them, okay, what are your strengths and your weaknesses? Can you, can you, can you tell me, you know, what makes you a unique snowflake, you know? Um, and then we just sort of hire one of them. We say, yeah, you're, you'll work. And then, like, in three months, you just regret the hell out of it. And you're like, damn it. And so then you, like, spend the next three months trying to, like, internally justify why you need to fire this guy. And then, you know, you fire them and then, oh, whoops, I, I got to panic again and start over the cycle. So, you know, you really come to the conclusion that, you know, if the best way that you will ever deal with a bad employee is just to not hire them. Like, let's just, you know, cut, cut this cycle out. Let's actually hire somebody that we really need that can really contribute to our organization and uh, get the get the right person in to begin with instead of wasting our time with, okay, going through and trying to go through this cycle. So you, how do we do that? Well, of course, every, you know, every manager is going to have a different idea or different way of doing it. But I wanted to kind of put together, okay, here are the, here are the ways that I found that actually work. This is, this is what, this is what's good. So the first thing you really need to think about, what are you actually looking for? What is the job you actually need this person to do. You know, your job description is mostly worthless. I mean, something is written by HR to sort of try and cover everything, you know, everything. I mean, you've got a job description, you know, you're kind of required to have it, but you really need to think, okay, what is this person really going to be doing? If, uh, you know, and so, and be specific, you know, if, if there's somebody who's going to be working on your, you know, Palo Alto firewalls all day or your Fortinet firewalls or whatever, I mean, if that's going to be their job, then you might want to actually think about, can they do this job that you're going to be hiring them for? If you need a pen tester, then they better be able to do pen test stuff. If, you know, you, you really got to be specific about what you're having them do. And this is, you, you know, and you also got to think, what are, what are the things that are important to me and my team? What makes us tick? What makes us operate? What makes us run? And so you're going to have things like, okay, how much experience is, is this somebody that I'm willing to, you know, pay, pay a little bit less for, but I'm willing to train them up and spend some extra time with and get them going? You know, do they kind of fit with our culture? I mean, do they actually care about security or are they just kind of, you know, IT guy who's like, I want to try that security stuff, you know? Um, do they have soft skills? Are they actually, uh, they have the right technical ability, you know. We have to actually think about what's important for 
us to be able to build the right employees and build the right team for uh, what we're trying to do. So the, the, the first thing that I found that's just incredibly powerful when you're doing this kind of thing, build a bench. You know, actually think about things that, you know, your online job postings are rarely going to get you the people that you actually want. You're going to have to filter through so much work and have to do it. Uh, to go through a ton of resumes, go through a ton of things. Sometimes these things actually work, but w when you actually get right down to it, you say, okay, you know, well, just enter this mode of continuously recruiting. I mean, you meet somebody who you think would be a perfect fit for your team. You meet them at a conference. You go out and visit a college. You know, I... Uh, a couple of universities around Spokane, they, they're they always, you know, happy to have speakers or anything come in. You just come in and talk about InfoSec. Talk about crazy things that you've seen while pen testing. And, you know, and then afterwards, you have a couple of a couple of the kids who are really excited about it come up to you and they're like, hey, you know, I, I want to know more about this. I want to, you know, get more involved in what's going on. I want to understand or, oh, yeah, I was doing this one thing. And, you know, you're actually going to get people who are passionate, interesting about what's interested in what, what's going on. You know, we've also tried other things, you know, like giving a bounty to employees, like, you know, you, you, there's no recommendation like the recommendation of a current employee. Somebody who's already in the team, who already knows how you tick, how you operate. They can think, you know, I know this guy who's going to be, who'd be perfect to be in here. We actually just basically set it up that, you know, if, if we've got some, if you recommend somebody for a job and they stick around, you know, for six months, they become a valuable part of the team. We'll give you a thousand bucks. Just, you know, throw it down. So, and you know, we found a couple of good employees by it. And you, you think thousand bucks, that's a lot of money. Th think about this, an online recruiting service, that's like $10,000, $20,000 to get somebody that's in there. Thousand bucks to an employee, I'd much rather give an employee a thousand bucks than, you know, give, uh, you know, give some uh, online recruiter that kind of money. You know, you, you can really uh, put, put together a, a really good bench of employees. The other thing that's great is you can actually know what your, uh, what these people's skills are. You know, there's a couple of people, you know, that are out there that have targeted, have, you know, thought about, you know, this, this person would be a great fit for the team. I don't have a position open for them right now, but you know, I know that, okay, it, you know, at some point, if I need somebody who can do, you know, uh, like, like auditing and that sort of thing, I've got somebody right on the bench that I can say, I know exactly about what this person know that she would fit immediately with this, you know, our organization, our culture, what we've got going on know the skill set, know everything, know even the salary requirements, know everything. It's like on the bench, it's a no-brainer, you know, what you've got right there. Um, so it's easy. The one thing, of course, that I found is that, you know, I run the, the just the one division of the company that does the security stuff. I ended up having, you know, my bench ended up being so good that my, my bench keeps getting poached by other people in the company. It's like, no, man, I found that guy. What are you doing? You can't take him. But, you know, at least you're getting the other thing, uh, the, the other uh, good people into the company. So, but the, the other thing that you really got to keep in mind is that your best employees probably already have a job. Um, you know, there, there are, you know, sometimes things happen and, you know, people lose their job and they're always looking for things. But usually your, your top notch employees are already going to be working somewhere else. So by actually going out and, and connecting and networking with people, you're going to actually be finding people that, uh, that, that you can kind of have in your, your employment bench that, yeah, they already have a job, but they might be looking to move. They might be looking to transition out of where they are and come work for you. So, so, you know, don't don't put too much into the whole stock of, you know, the whole idea of doing the online job posting or anything or, you know, trolling LinkedIn to try and find somebody. It's that you're going to be spending a lot of time wasting your time doing that. Um, the other thing uh, just to, to keep in mind uh, when you're looking at people's resumes and, you know, it's, it's, it is kind of common sense, but... Uh, you know, I, I like to call resumes the internet of job hiring. In other words, they're mostly bullshit. Um, you, you, you really gotta gotta watch out and look for the red flags, look for what's actually you know go, going on in people's resumes. People love to inflate their um, you know what what they're doing. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, cer certain things like when people have a typo in the phrase, "I have a great attention to detail." That's probably you know a, a, a red flag. Has been done. Um, you know, if they can't even organize their own resume, I mean, it's going to be really hard for if you got to put together a pen test report or something else for a client. You know, are they going to be able to do that if they can't even organize their own damn resume? You know, it's something to really keep in mind. You know, um, the, the qualifiers. These these are my favorites. This is you know, I had exposure to Linux. What the hell does that mean? I mean, honestly, what does that mean? Oh, you know, I I I sold I sold the shirt one time when a guy was uh, you know logging into a Linux box. Yeah, I had exposure to Linux, or you know, I attended this college. 
well, did you graduate? What classes did you take? What did you do? It's the, does it does that that means absolutely nothing to me if you say I attended, or you know I assisted with this project. What did you do? Go get the guy coffee. I mean, you know, did you actually did you work on a firewall? Did you do this? No, you know, you you you, know, you were around to go get the sandwiches at lunch. I I assisted with that project. Damn it, you know. I mean, you gotta you know when people use qualifiers. I always just sort of mark that in the resume. And when when if I if I do actually if they do make it to like an interview round or something, I'm gonna call them out on that. I'm gonna ask them what what exactly did you do? I mean, come on. Um, but, you know, the other thing is, you know, a certain level of professionalism, you know, if somebody has the, the email address bronyforlife at hotmail.com on their business resume, uh, you know, maybe there's a certain uh, question of tact or, you know, whether they, they would actually have the professionalism to be able to do the job if that's what they're putting on their resume. You know, maybe you know, want to think about that. The other one that's, that, that everyone loves to talk about is like the strange gaps in employment. You know, if, uh, you know and, and it's all cool. I mean, people lose their job. They go off and do something else for a while. It's not really relevant to the job history. That's fine. But, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely worth asking, you know, if somebody has a four-year gap, I mean, are they just trying to hide something or trying to hide that, you know, I work for this guy and, you know, I got fired because I was a terrible employee and all that. I don't want you to talk to him, you know. It's, 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 it's usually a good idea to kind of key in on those strange gaps and just sort of say, okay, what's going on if you actually are talking to them. This is the other thing to really think about when you're, when you're looking at um, going through the hiring process. Sometimes the best employee is not the best candidate. So you've got the, you know, the, the guy who comes in with the pristine resume, all polished, you know, has all the great, the perfect answers for every single standard interview question is probably because he's been through about 50 interviews and jumps jobs every two years and does a lot of other things. You know, the, 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 it's okay for your candidates to not be perfect, but you know, you, you want to actually, uh, think about, you, you know, you don't want to actually have a, somebody who's just the, the pristine, the, the pristine candidate. They're not exactly, they might not be the guy that you're actually after. So, um, a few other things I like to do um, as as you're going through the hiring process, trying to find people. Um, you know, I really like to pre-screen. You know, let's let, let you know you go through, you find some resumes and some things, some people you actually want to talk to. It's it's not a bad idea to actually just do a sanity check on the resume. You know, filter out somebody because let's face it, interviewing is a pain in the ass. Okay. You know, it is, it is a, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. You know, you basically have to block out half a day. And, you know, for all of us who are really busy, have a lot of projects going on, that's a, a huge time investment. The last thing you want to do is have an interview with somebody, which is an absolute waste of your time. It's like, okay, I just took that half hour, hour, flushed it down the toilet. And I'm just not getting that back. And, you know, if I've got other projects I have to take care of, probably going to be end up doing those at night. And I'm going to hear about it from my wife and it's not going to be fun. And, you know, I, I don't want to get into that. So, why not just filter some people out? Um, you know, one of the things I love to do is the the written pre-screen. Um, you know, it's really easy. You could you, know, you could just throw together something on just Survey Monkey or something and email it out to somebody. Just test their writing ability and their ability to interact with clients or send an email or do something like that. I mean, you can you know tell them, hey, I've got this email from a client who's completely pissed off. You know, just tell them this is the email you just received from a client. You know, how do you handle this? And just see if their writing skills are even up to it. See if they can actually handle you know, being able to diplomatically calm down some sort of client that's really ticked off at you or dealing with somebody like that. Um, the other thing, just, just to, uh, make things really simple. I mean, just tell them, okay, just describe for me the list of steps you'd take to investigate a malware infection or, you know, heck you can even take it down even to, to the, you know, b bottom level, how write out a list of steps to troubleshoot a printer that won't print. I mean, let's, let's go all the way back to just it 101. You're not really looking for the answer of how they do it. You're looking for how can they organize a list? Can they actually put things together? Do they have decent writing skills? Are they gonna is it gonna be filled with typos? Is it gonna look like crap? You know, you, you know, having decent writing skills is almost mandatory for what you're what you're wanting to do. So you you want to make sure that you can filter that kind of thing out. Um, the other thing, quick, easy way to do it, just do a phone pre-screen. You know, uh, just see what they sound like on the phone. If they sound like a complete idiot on the phone, then, you know, they're probably not going to be a good fit. And you can save yourself a lot of time with a five-minute phone call that you would have otherwise had to waste a bunch of time on. Yeah, you know, I mean, and you can, and this is actually a decent spot that because you're not really after, um, you know, uh, big, you know, you're not, you're not actually after real kind of interview questions. If, you know, HR wants you to ask all the classic interview questions, you know, that, I mean, you know, the phone pre-screen, not a bad time to do it. Just get those out of the way and just say, cause really all you want to do is you, you just want to hear what they sound like, how they organize the thought, if they can actually communicate with you at all. 
if they can't, you can just kind of get them out there. It's another good thing to do is to uh, notify them of any bookkeeping. You know, you filter out some people. You know, notify them. Okay, if you have to do a background check, drug check, anything like that, you know, credit check, anything that you're required to do as part of the job, it's a good idea to notify them then. So in case you know, oh yeah, I've got uh, two felonies, and if I get a third strike, I go to prison for my life. Well. Okay, well, maybe we can just end this right here. Let's let's move on. The other thing, uh, and this one's kind of, you can find, and if you look at hiring advice, if you look at hiring blogs, books, whatever, you find this advice absolutely go both directions, completely. You either find those that say you should get salary requirements out of the way first, immediately, just get them over with and find out uh, what's going on. Other people are like, you know, you really shouldn't talk about that till later. I, I, I actually fall in the former camp. I'd like to know really what I'm up against because, you know, I have a candidate that comes in and is absolutely perfect. Perfect. And if he wants, you know, like twice what I have in my budget to be able to pay him, I'd rather know now. Let's just not waste. I don't want to waste his time either, because clearly if he's a really good candidate, you know, he's, his time's valuable. I don't want to waste his time. I don't want to waste my time. You know, let's let's go ahead and just forget about that right now and get it out of the way. So I, I like to just go ahead and you know, on the phone pre-screen, you know, just kind of say, you know, what, what are you what are you looking for? Um, just so that we can actually kind of get it out of the way. Um, you know, the thing to keep in mind, though, is that you know this really doesn't have to be formal. I mean, you can, you know, if you if I have a uh, you know a kid that sort of emails me up after a talk, I go out to a college, he emails me up, I'm interested in a job, I, you know, I can just write a couple of emails back and forth with them, and I can already tell a decent amount about their writing skills just through that. I mean, it doesn't have to be this big formalized process. You know, if you want it to be, it can be great, uh, but it doesn't have to be. You can also just pick up the phone and hey, you know, what's going on? And this is actually my absolute favorite thing to do, and I found it just works fantastic. Just 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 a happy hour. Just set up a little event. It doesn't even have to matter. Just a happy hour, wine tasting, beer tasting, sporty event, whatever. And just, you know, anyone that you're considering hiring that you kind of have on that bench, you know, in the back of your mind, I'd like to hire this guy someday. Just check him an invite. Get him out there. You know, again, the, the, the amount of money that you're going to spend on doing something like this is a fraction of what you're going to pay for an online recruiter. And, you know, with the recruiters, you never know who you're going to get, if they're going to fit your culture, if they're actually going to fit anything you want. It works great. And not to mention the fact that you could actually, you know, have, see how they interact with your team. You know, bring some of your other guys down there, have them hang out, talk, have a couple beers with each other and just, you know, see how they interact. I mean, you know, you might find that, you know, they're more interested in sitting there the whole time and kissing your butt instead of actually, you know, learning about the, the rest of your team that you have there. Well, that, you know, it's something it's you know a full flag you might have in your mind of okay that's how they're going to act um and the, the biggest reason i like to do this honestly is that you know this is my rule of that you know if i can't stand to sit down at a table and have a beer with a guy for a half hour i damn sure don't want to hire him you know i i i, I you know let's let's just be completely honest here you know um you know and, and this is the big thing you know let's keep in mind that everything that i have listed so far in this talk is something you could do before you ever even consider stepping in an interview room. Like, you know, when you actually think about, you know, if you apply all these rules and you actually think about what, you know, I've gone over here and what I've talked about, you've filtered out a hell of a lot of people from, you know, your, your candidate pool. You actually don't have to worry about, uh, you know, a lot of people who just might not work out or that you might not fit your culture, might not fit what you're trying to do, you know, and we, we haven't even bothered to start interviewing yet. So, um, from there, you know, I, and, and that's the thing, like, I, I actually feel like I've, I've got a really good team now. They work together well. They do everything, you know, and, and, and the thing is, is that all the key players on it are people that I vetted before I hired that I had a pretty good idea even before they came in that, you know, that they were going to be the top candidate before we even got in there because they, you know, they, they already fit. So, um, I really encourage you to actually think about that if you're in a position where you have to hire. Um, the, the other thing here is, so when it actually comes to doing the actual interview itself, um, you, you really want to choose your questions and choose them well. You know, your interview should be short. You're really going to know a lot of what you need to know fairly quickly. Um, I, you know, particularly for a first interview, you know, it's the best thing to do is again, kind of going back to the very beginning, list what's important to you. Go through and hammer out, okay, these are the things I absolutely need for the job. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, every question, I mean, don't, don't waste your time putting in throwaway questions. Put in, you know, things that are actually identify these critical things. So, like, you know, in, in my case, usually what I, you know, try and do is hammer out, you know, okay, you know, about 50% of the interview, I'm going to have, you know, sort of technical questions because it's generally technical role that I'm going to be hiring for. I need to know what their technical skill set is, where they are, what's going on. You know, the, the must-haves, you know, you just, you know, you have one or two questions that are absolutely must-have. 
Like these, these are things I need to get a good answer out of this question. Flag those things. Some other things that are nice to have, you know, one to two. Overall, though, I mean, eight to ten questions, and you, you should know what you need to know. Um, if you, you know, want to do more uh, than that, you know, or, or after you've gone through this initial screening, you might have two, three guys that are left that are, hey, these guys are all pretty good. I can think you, you always bring back them for a second interview, but that way you're not actually wasting your time with, you know, going through a big, long laundry list of, of, uh, questions within the interview uh, to go through. So this is my particular list. Um, I want people with some sort of technical ability. I mean, obviously, they've, they've got to have some sort of skill set. They have to have at least a baseline. Even if they're green and I'm going to train them, I still want them to actually be able to handle the basics of the job, actually have some sort of level of competency when they're walking in the door. You know, for a more senior position, then obviously I need, you know, people who are a lot more skilled. The, the other thing, I mean, honestly, I want people that are passionate about InfoSec. I, I don't really have, you know, I, I, I personally think that if you're an InfoSec, it can be thankless enough as it is. You're going to get stuck in long hours. I mean, you're going to, you know, I mean, you're out on some pen test. I, I want the guy who's like so eager to solve the puzzle that he's not afraid to be working at, you know, 1.30 in the morning trying to bang away. God, I almost have it. Almost have it. I want to get it. You know, that, I mean, you got to have that guy that's really interested and really excited about, you know, solving the puzzle. Or, you know, if there's a, you know, if, if you're on more of the blue team side, somebody that's actually looking through the, you know, the, the data and they may basically find something. And I mean, they're the type of employee that you have to tell them you know, God damn it, go home. You know, you've been here long enough. I mean, that's the kind of employee that you want to have on your team. Somebody who's actually enthusiastic about what they're doing. They're really excited. They're always out reading blogs, you know, checking out Twitter, finding out new things that are going on. Like, I want people on my team that I'm finding out stuff from that I'm like, holy crap, this is awesome. You know, good find. I mean, that's that's what I want. I obviously, need some level of ethics about, you know, what you're doing. I mean, in the, you, you know, and that's, 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 it, it really is kind of a tough thing, but you, you don't, you know, you can't really have somebody if you're, if you're going off and doing pen tests on banks and everything, you, you don't have to have, don't want to have somebody that you're worried about, you know, you, you stay awake at night saying, okay, what were they actually doing, you know, in there? I mean, am I going to find out later that they were put in black doors? I mean, am I going to have to worry about my, you know, am I actually have to invoke that professional liability insurance that, you know, we keep, I don't really want to ever have to deal with that. Um, fit with the culture. I mean, Honestly, you know, when you have a good team that's working like a well-oiled machine and people are getting along, nothing can ruin that worse than somebody who just doesn't fit at all. And, and I mean, they don't have to be the perfect fit. I mean, people are all different. You don't want a bunch of clones that all think the same way. But if you if you got guys that are just totally, totally off the deep end, that are just completely uh, not gonna not gonna fit with your culture at all, that, you know, it's probably best they they find work somewhere else. I mean, you can you know put together a uh, you can put together a great team that actually works together, communicates well. If they're all sort of on the same page, it really it's going to help the way things go. And then obviously the the last one that I have to have is somebody who has good communication, good soft skills. You know, at, at this point, you know, I don't have anyone that I can you know, bury in the basement and just, you know, never let the client see this guy and everything. You, you got to have somebody that's, that's going to be actually out there and able to be in front of the clients. Like anytime you have a client, you want, you want to be able to stick them out in front of them and not have to worry about, Oh God, am I going to get a call? Am I going to get a call? You know, you, you, you want somebody who's good. So, uh, when it actually comes time for the interview, um, I, I have found that, uh, a lot of people, um, Sometimes when, uh, you know, when people are hiring, you know, they just want to have just one person. I, I think it's always better to have at least multiple opinions in there, but don't, don't go crazy. I mean, this isn't, you know, we don't need to, you know, be the meeting of the joint chiefs or, you know, whatever. We don't need to have uh, 20 people in the room, everyone giving their opinion because everything just clou gets clouded up. Just, you know, pick maybe one person that you really trust. I mean, I'm usually in the room with, uh, I actually usually interview with our HR manager who's completely non-technical at all. And it actually kind of gives me, it, it can give me a good perspective because that's one of the things I always love to do in the soft skills type of interview is, okay, what you just explained, explain it to her. Okay. Now let's, you know, yeah, okay. You're really smart. I believe you, you, you're correct in what you're doing, but she didn't understand a word you said. So, you know, you know, explain it to my HR person. Um, you know, the, the other thing <laughs> that, I always tell people is that, you know, I, when, when I first started, um, uh, started doing IT, I was working for a city job and there was the, the like city rules of, you know, if you ask any interviewer, you know, if, if you ask an interviewee these five questions, you have to ask every single interviewee these exact five questions. Okay. 
you know, thankfully I'm not doing that anymore. You know, so I kind of have a little bit of leeway. I can actually ask a lot of other questions and do what I want to do, but just don't be afraid to pull the plug. If, you know, if you're five minutes into this thing and you know that this guy isn't going to work, I mean, you know, like I said, me and the HR manager, we kind of just have that little, you know, look we can give each other and then we just start skipping questions and let's just, okay, let them get out of this interview with a little bit of dignity, but let's just get it over with because we've all got too many important things to do and let's not actually waste their time going through the interview and, you know, and, and, and going through a bunch of stuff, you know, let's not waste their time. Let's not waste our time. You know, if we already know this person is not going to be a good fit and I mean, totally glaringly, not a good fit, you'll know, get them out of there. Um, another thing that, that that's great to do is, you know, if, if, you know, if you've got a couple candidates that you liked, I mean, don't, don't leave them hanging. You know, if you, if you, if there's some sort of delay in making a decision or delay in figuring things out, don't be afraid to just say, Hey, uh, you know, send them in a little email, say, you know, hey, thank you for coming in. You know, we're still working on some stuff. I mean, you know, doing it, everyone can remember when you're, you've done a job interview, you've gone in and you, you thought it went well, but you don't know. And then you wait a week, two weeks, you're just not hearing anything. It's, it's, it's aggravating. So if you're, if it's not going to work out, yeah, you can let them know, you know, but if it is, you know, if it's something you're in a job interview, so if somebody has a major problem, uh, like hygiene. If somebody can't shower before they go to a job interview, that's a problem. Uh, if they're totally inappropriate attire, that wouldn't make any sense. So they show up late, you know, have bad time management, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's not good. I actually had one guy that, well, you know, that's nice and all, but what, what does that kind of tell me about you that you're already out here, you know, just complaining and moaning about all this other stuff? I mean, what, what happens the first time things get a little tough around here? Are you going to run around telling everyone how much we suck? Is that what's going to happen here? What's going on? It just struck me as a red flag in front of them and being able to actually, you, you know, have them not embarrass you, embarrass your organization. Those are things to always keep in mind. Uh, when you begin the interview... <laughs> thing to keep in mind that this is their first impression of you usually. So you want to actually be on your best behavior too and actually show them, hey, this is a place that you really do want to work because you don't want to have the perfect candidate come along and yeah, they don't want to work with you because, you know, you spent the whole interview checking your email on your phone or something dumb like that. Uh, you want to highlight elements of your culture that makes it makes your place unique. I mean, we've got a whole uh, thing where we Every time someone's hired, we issue them a Nerf gun, and they're expected to defend themselves at all times. And generally, on your first day on the job, you get shot to hell. I mean, that's just part of the culture. It's one of those things that happens. So if you've got that sort of element in your culture, highlight it, make them understand this is something that you actually, you know, that we're, we're a group that you want to be a part of. Uh, you want to clearly highlight and explain the role of the person. Like, what are they actually going to be doing? You know, as a caveat, don't actually tell them everything that you're looking for in an employee. People are really smart about that. The minute they hear, hey, I might, you might be looking for this, they immediately will shift and tell you all about how they're perfect at just that particular thing. If you say, you know, I'm, you know, looking for a particular, particular trait, they're, they're going to be talking, you know, if, if you say, I need somebody who's going to be reliable, they'll spend the rest of the interview talking about how reliable they are. You know, you just be, be careful about that kind of thing. And also, you know, be on time. You know, their, their time's valuable. Your time's valuable. Actually think about those kind of things. If you're an employee and you're going into an interview, think about a few other things. You know, if the interviews, the interviewer is late, that's probably not a good idea. You know, if they spend the whole time also talking crap about the person you're replacing, oh God, I'm so glad we're rid of that guy. We want to hire somebody new. It's like, well, what are they going to say about me if they ever get rid of me? Are they just going to sit there and tell everyone how, how crappy I was and what, what I did? You know, I, I don't really think that that's a very good thing. <laughs> this is the biggest red flag that, uh, I, can ever say for someone, if you're going in for a job interview, if the person who's hiring you can't actually explain to you what you're going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, they, they don't know what the hell they're doing. I don't know if you really want to be part of that company. It's you know, They really should have a good vision of what you're going to be doing, how you're going to be contributing. Obviously, positions change, things change, but they should have a good idea of how they're going to be using you. You don't want to be just... It's a pretty unfulfilling job just sitting in a cubicle waiting for somebody to tell you something to do. It's It, it, it sucks. Um, you, you know, if, if you're, if they haven't even looked at your resume before the interview, eh, you know, are, are they really that invested in this? Are they actually looking at you? I always, as a guy who's hiring, I always love to take, you know, take, take at least a few minutes. If they, if they're actually making it to the interview, 
take a few minutes to actually look over the resume, jot down a few th questions about it, actually ask them things that are important about their resume and actually talk to them about it. Um, these are your interview classics that everyone uh, loves to talk about. HR makes me have them in there sometimes, um, but I think they're generally fairly worthless. I mean, are you a team player? Why no, I am not a team player, I'm a raging dick. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, you know, list your strengths and weaknesses. And that one, I, I love people's answers with that. I, you know, they, they, they list off all their strengths and then they manage to list a weakness that somehow makes them, uh, makes it a strength, you know. I just work too hard. I, you know, I am so overly devoted to my job. I don't know what to do without it. Come on. You know, what does that actually tell me about you other than, you know, you get creative about having to figure out what sort of weaknesses out there. Where do you see yourself in five years? I don't really know. You know, I, I need someone to work right now. I don't really give a crap about five years. You know, I, it doesn't really help me out. So th these are the things that I really like to, to interview about and some of the questions I like to use. I want somebody who's passionate about InfoSec. I mean, this is the first question I uh, generally start out every interview with. Where do you get your InfoSec news from? CNN. Okay. I, no, I don't think so. Uh, t tell me at least one interesting story you've heard about in the last week. You know, and if, if people get stumped, it's like, well, just tell me one interesting story you've heard about. If they're completely stumped or they keep, you know, it's like, I, I actually had, I had a guy, I was, I was interviewing a guy and asking him, and it was just like, three days after the target breach, and he couldn't name me one story. It's like, I don't think you're really that passionate about this whole InfoSec thing. I don't think you're really looking at things, figuring things out. You know, you, you want answers like, you know, I, at, at the very least, you know, I get news from, you know, Twitter or, you know, some, somewhere else. I mean, something that's not like mainstream news. If somebody says, oh, yeah, occasionally something pops up on MSN, you know, like, come on. You know, you're, 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 you're interested in InfoSec. You're not passionate about InfoSec. Uh, you know, another great question that's easy is you ask people, you know, what does your home lab look like? How do you, uh, how do you practice your exploits or how do you practice what you're doing? It's, it, it's, it's a simple question. I mean, you know, people, you, you want answers like, oh, you know, I've got a old, uh, you know, ton of old machines and I do this or, you know, I've got a whole bunch of vulnerable VMs that I love to practice on and love to do all these other things. You know, th that's a good answer. I mean, people who are just like, oh, I don't really have one. I don't, you know. That could be kind of a red flag. I mean, are they really that passionate about it if they're not actually trying to do their, uh, if, if they're not actually trying these exploits? They don't like hear about, you know, the first thing, you know, I, I don't know about the rest of you, the first thing I do when I, I hear about some crazy exploit, the first thing I want to do is I don't really want to try that. That sounds awesome. You know, that, those are the kind of people you want. Th this is like, you know, and the next question, you know, what, what's the coolest hack you've ever encountered? I mean, that's like, I mean, seriously, walk out there, find someone at random and ask them that. It's like crack cocaine. You know, it's like, oh, shit, I heard about this the other day. It was so awesome. They just, you know, they can't shut up about it. If you get someone that's actually passionate about it, people who don't really care, they're, you know, oh, I don't know. You know, it, it, you can really weed that out. And, and, and again, I love people who are passionate about InfoSec. Even if their technical skills aren't there, I'd rather take someone who just their heart and soul, their passion's in it. They want to learn. They want to know about it. That's, that's the guys, the kind of guys I want on my team. Uh, ethics questions, you know, the, sort of a basic kind of cl uh, classic one, you know, tell me about some ethical dilemma you faced in the past, how you handled it, what you learned from it, what would you do differently? That's kind of a, kind of, kind of a standard one. Um, I, I generally like to give people like a, a scenario based one. Uh, and, and this actually happened. I'm not making it. I, I was at a, at a client and we were just kind of doing an audit and I had a guy tell me that, um, you know, IT guy is like, well, I don't think we're secure enough. So, I, I tried to hack my uh, third-party web hosting vendor, you know, and I'm, I, I hacked the shit out of him. I did all this other stuff. I'm like, okay, well, that's, you know, that, that kind of brings up an awkward thing. It's like, okay, well, you know, he's great at, you know, he's, he's interested in what he's doing and everything like that. But, I mean, think about that for a minute. You know how much trouble that you could get in for, for doing that, you know, through your own, you know, from, from your business. Oh, I'm just going to hack my web hosting kind of thing. Well, what would you do? How would they handle that? I don't know if there is exactly a right answer of, you know, how to move forward, but, you know, that's definitely an odd scenario of what you would do. You know, you might want to know that. Um, do you fit with our culture? You know, um, uh, you know, kind of some more of a standard question. You know, what are the positive aspects of your current job and work environment? What do you like? What do you like about your current job? Have them actually tell you, here's the things that I think are really cool about where I work right now. Um, 
as opposed to just having to badmouth it. Say, this is, these, these are the things I like. These are the things that work well. Um, you know, another one, you, know, you, you can kind of look at how they work on a team as opposed to saying, are you a team player? You know, you can say things like, you know, what, what's, what role do you like to play on the team? You know, what, what, what do you usually play? Tell me about a project that you did and what, you know, one of the projects that you really enjoyed that you felt was really successful. Tell me what, what did you do on that project and what, what role did you play? I mean, you can kind of get a good idea of, well, you know, I jumped out front and I researched this and I did that, you know, or I found this problem and then I went and got help and I figured out this whole thing. Get, get the whole story. You know, are, are they just a, you know, a worker bee? I mean, do you need a worker bee? That's fine. But if, are they just, going to be the, the one who's in there doing the wrench turning or they somebody wants to jump to the front and figure out what's going on. It gives you a good insight on, as to what their team is. The final question is a question that I have to ask at every single interview. And, you know, if, if I, I ask people to tell me if they prefer ninjas, pirates, or zombies, and why. And uh, the main reason for this is that I want to know if they actually fit into the culture. And, you know, I actually had one person, uh, she told me immediately without hesitation, none of the above, robots. I said, you're hired. That's what I said. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it's just, you know, it's a thing about it, you know, our, 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 you know, just sort of our corporate culture is that, you know, I want people to actually have a sense of humor that can, you know, take a joke during the middle of an interview, you know, kind of go forward with that. Soft skills, you know, easy one. It's kind of a softball, but tell me, tell me what you know about our company. You know, did they actually research your company? Did they actually take the time or are they just kind of showing up for another job interview, kind of doing their thing? Uh, kind of like I was saying earlier, Explain, uh, you know, explain how a man in the middle attacks to my HR director. You know, how, how exactly does that work? You know, can they, can they actually break a complicated technical attack down of some, you know, crazy DNS spoofing or crazy ARP spoofing, doing something crazy? Like, can they actually break that down to a, 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 a you know, a, a level that somebody with very little technical knowledge can actually understand? Um, you know, uh, an, an easy one that, that can tell you a lot about how a person thinks is just what do you think it takes to effectively manage an organization's information security? Do they have big picture? I mean, are they going to actually, what, what are they going to say? I mean, people who, you know, start talking about, you know, antivirus and endpoint and like all this other stuff. Well, okay, then they, they really have a, you know, a very ground level knowledge of what's going on. If they actually start talking about architecture and, you know, devices and everything, you might get a very technical response. Some people might start talking about, you know, you policy, social engineering training, everything. They start thinking at a high level. Some people might actually go through the whole thing. Gives you a good idea of where their brain's at and where they work. I like that one. Uh, technical questions. And this is the part that they should just hit out of the ballpark. If they, you know, th these are the things that they actually should do. I, I love to test people's breadth of knowledge. Um, you, you know, you get a good idea of where their limitations are. I don't ever be afraid to make these questions hard. Just grill them. Go through the whole list of questions, things that are actually really difficult, really hard. The best employees are always going to like to be challenged. If, if you're not giving them, you know, hard questions, you, you know, you don't want to just toss out easy things to them. You, know, you want to say, um, you, you want to know, and, and even if you get to a question that they don't know the answer to, that can actually be a real benefit because you, you get them thinking through their mind. You get to understand how they think and how they react when they're confronted with something that they don't know about. So if they actually are going to work through the problem, think about it, or they're just going to bail and I, I don't know, I'm sorry. You know, how, how are they going to handle that, that type of situation? Some easy ones you can throw out there. Describe in technical detail how a botnet works. Uh, you know, if somebody says that they're passionate about InfoSec and comes in, but they can't just tell you at least on some basic level how a botnet works, eh, that's probably a, probably a warning sign that they, this is not somebody you want to have in your organization. You know, easy, you know, what's the difference between coding, encryption, and hashing? That's, that's an easy one. Another thing I love to do is throw out a packet capture. Just take a Wireshark packet capture of something and just drop it in front of them and tell me, what do you see? You know, it's funny the kind of things that you'll, you'll see. Like, yeah, I have one that I, I've used in interviews in the past that was just a packet capture of, I, I started Wireshark, I opened my web browser and went to ESPN.com and then stopped Wireshark. That was it. And then just stick it in front of them. And I have heard the craziest freaking stories about what people are like. I had one guy tell me this is clearly a denial of service attack. Really? <laughs> I, I just, you know, it, it's, it's interesting how people, when they don't know, they, they tend to try and make up something. It's like, no, this is pretty, pretty straightforward what's going on here. Um, just some other samples, maybe get a little harder, you know. Tell me an example of what a blind SQL injection attack looks like. You know, that's a, that's a good one. You know, list all the ways uh, you can think of to prevent malware from executing on a midpoint. You know, are, are they just going to go to AV and more AV and more AV? Or are they actually going to start thinking about some other ways that you might prevent malware on an endpoint? Um, 
Another question, you know, uh, you know, describe public key cryptography and give examples of how it would be used to ensure confidentiality and integrity. I mean, you know, make it make it a question a little bit. You know, that should be something that someone should be able to uh, answer. You know, tell them, you know, if you actually want to, you know, get hard and you want to ask them something that maybe they might not know the answer to, and say, you know, explain the difference between a buffer overflow and a heap spray. You know, what's what's the difference? Compare, compare it to me. You know, if if they know it, great. Then they're you know really passionate about InfoStack. They know what's going on. They know how exploits work. They're down and dirty into that. If they don't know, that's fine. But at least you've you've determined. Okay, here's the the baseline. Here's the end of their knowledge. If it actually comes down to doing a second interview or actually coming down to that, never forget that a demo is actually worth a thousand interview questions. If you can actually get them to show you what they know, it's way better because people can BS their way through a question. You know, they can, they can convince you that they know something, but if they don't actually know something, uh, they're not going to really be able to demo it for you. So for like a penetration tester, simple, simple. I, you know, I've done this before. I give people, uh, like, uh, and, and just an in-map scan of a network. Just, you know, you, you can even print it out on a piece of paper, hand it to them, say, okay, well, here's, here's an in-map scan. You know, there's about 10 hosts in there. Just draw me that network on the board, on the whiteboard. Um, you know, uh, uh, the other thing you could do is just give them a, give them an info gathering target and tell them, okay, well, you got 10 minutes. Get as much information about this person as possible and tell me how you would spearfish this guy. You know, that's, that could be a good one. You know, the other thing you can do is just, just have a lab in there and have them plug in. Just say, here's, you know, here's a Kali Linux, you know, install. Just see what all you can own. You know, give them half hour, hour, see what they can do. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing that says that, you know, an interview just has to be a bunch of questions. There's no reason to, to look at that. Seri you know, security analysts actually have them parse a packet capture, have them go through some log files. Um, you know, give them a list of events and have them categorize it by risk, like, and actually have them justify why is this more dangerous than this? You know, there's no reason why you can't have them do that, you know? You know, you can even have them look at a look at a sim and say, "Okay, wh where where are the interesting events? What's what's the crazy things that are going on? What's the things that we should be the most worried about?" I mean, you can always do things like this to have them do that. A engineer and architect, you know, maybe have them you know work out some firewall rules based on some specifications. You know, I, I love I love just asking people open ended questions like, "Would you whiteboard out a secure network for me?" It's like, you know, what does that mean? Well, you know, you can learn about a, a lot about a person about how they interpret that question, how they actually go through and draw it out. Um, th this one almost falls in the category of being mean, but you deliberately misconfigure something and then see if they can fix it. You know, that can be something that, uh, that can be pretty interesting, you know, to see how people work through a problem, how they approach it. You know, demos are great, particularly, but again, never waste a demo on in a first interview. Make sure they actually get through that first one before you waste it, because th th these can take a lot of time and you don't want to actually spend a bunch of time on, you know, dealing with people going through a demo if, if they're not going to be a good candidate. Um, when, when it comes time to end the interview, um, you know, easy, easy one is, you know, do you have any questions for us? You know, see, see what, see if they've been listening. You know, good candidates usually have questions. They want to know, okay, well, what is it about this place that makes it special? What do I, you know, what are my benefits going to look like? I mean, even, even if they're, you know, whatever the questions are, you, you know, you know, good candidates usually aren't going to just be like, um, no, okay. See you later. I mean, that's not typically good candidates are ones that actually, you know, are going to be engaged in the process. They're going to have some questions for you. You know, leave this as a chance to close. I mean, you know, to use a sales term. I mean, if, if this is somebody that you think, hey, this guy's got a lot of potential. I want this guy in my company. Um, you know, highlight the desirable aspects of your company again. You know, reiterate their expectations. Give them, um, give them fair expectations about when you're going to be making a decision and try and stick to it. If you don't stick to it, follow up with them. Let them know what's going on. I mean, this is, this is your chance to kind of close it out and actually do it. Um, so we've gone through this process. You know, we've hired somebody. Now what? Um, this is just sort of, uh, just as one little note. Everyone, you know, you spend a ton of time hiring someone, finding the right candidate, doing everything. Never forget, um, the day that everyone remembers the most on any job is their first day and their last one. So make it a real positive impression. I mean, if no one wants their first day to be their onboarding to be, okay, I came in and I watched eight hours of training videos and then I went home. It's, you know, all the energy and excitement that they have about having a new job, you kind of took a, you curbed a lot of that out. Make sure they can contribute. Have fun. Actually, have them jump in and actually contribute. Be like, I'm so glad you're here. Here's a problem that we've been trying to fix for a while. I'm just going to have you jump right into it and see what you can solve. You know, here are some ideas. Get them in with a team. Get them interacting with people. Actually make them feel like they're part of the team on day one. Um, I think that's really, really important. So uh, you, as a just sort of a final thing to my talk here, uh, 
this is something that, you know, for, um, for people like me who came out of just a purely technical background now and more of a manager role, try to figure this out. I mean, I'd love to know what I can do more, you know, for the, for the community, for everyone sort of on this topic. If, uh, you know, it's this, you know, something where we should have like a questions database of, you know, interview questions that, you know, we, we like to go through ways of interviewing, ways of talking. Is there, you know, other topics that, you know, about, you know, management and doing these other things that are useful to a technical audience that are, that are able to, we're actually able to look at and, um, discuss and help us all get better at this particular topic. I mean, I'd love to hear it. Um, you know, love to figure out a way that, uh, I can continue to contribute and give back. And so just sort of close up. Thank you very much to B sides for having me talk today. I appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, you know, I welcome any questions that people have. Uh, love to talk. So yeah. How you doing? Uh, yeah. I, I have an issue at my work where our HR department <laughs> Why we selected a particular candidate. Right, right. Um, I'm wondering, like, to my mind, I figure I can tell when allows me to ask multiple choice. Do you have any other ideas? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, usually, you know, I, I would certainly never do the multiple choice. I mean, you, know, you, you usually want to have some sort of standardized, you know, at least, you know, ask at least the basic same questions to the same ones, but. You know, just because HR wants you to ask, um, you know, standard type of questions doesn't necessarily mean that you can't ask the specific ones that you want. And, you know, as long as you get through those questions, typically if there's ways that you follow up, like, you know, I want to, I want to follow up on this, this answer that somebody gave or did that thing. I mean, that's perfectly, I think that's perfectly fair. Um, you know, they can, you know, so, sometimes it can get you a little, in a little bit of trouble, but if you, uh, you know, you just kind of have to, you know, we're all hackers. Figure out how to work within the system to, to break the system. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Uh, there are no other questions. I'll ask you another one. Um, sure. I've kind of found that interviewing candidates and being interviewed is almost like dating. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Some common ground there. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions on how you can narrow in on something that they actually know something about when you do the interview? Or do you recommend just hitting with the shotgun spread of questions? Well, you know, as opposed to going to the shotgun, I would really like, kind of like I said, go back to what you really think that they're going to need to do, the most critical things that they're going to have to do. And if you really target those particular things, I think that that basically, that'll give you a really good picture of, of what they are. I, you know, it, it, it is a lot like dating. It really is. And that's kind of almost why, you know, I, I love getting them out for a beer first, <laughs> just to be honest with you. Um, you know, and, and anytime anyone pushes back on budget with that, I'm like, eh, you know. How much money am I saving by not having to get rid of somebody later? It's, you know, a couple beers. It's, you can afford it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Right, yeah. She's brilliant. You can teach her to say stupid things. Well, I, you know, I, I would say that uh, just sort of like, um, I, I think that that is a battle that's probably best fought before the interviews even start. I mean, obviously, you know, too late after the fact. But if you can really convince them of, okay, well, here are the things that we actually really, really, truly need. If you can actually get that hammered into their head and, you know, unfortunately, sometimes with this kind of thing, it's like results. If you, you know, when, when they get tired of, you know, tripping over themselves enough times, I mean, I've had, I, I'm actually not kidding. I've had other managers of other departments ask me to do their hiring for them. Um, so it's, if you can actually get that into that kind of position where you, you can fight that battle beforehand, um, and really kind of present your case well, because it's, uh, you really do if you can actually hire the right people the first time. It's really so much of a cost savings. There's there's a, there's a huge amount of efficiency that you save, and you, you you really do save a lot of time. So, oh yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Sure. How 
I, I, I love the open-ended type of ones. I like to actually have the discussion. That's kind of t why I tend to have try and keep the, the number of questions at least as much limited as I can because I, I, I want to be able to follow up with people. I want to be able to kind of go through and let them do those open-ended questions because I really, I mean, the open-ended ones do definitely tend to tell people a little bit more about what their, what their knowledge is and what their thought process is than if you just ask them a really point-blank question, then, you know, they're kind of getting, you, you know, you never want to answer. I mean, the, the worst thing you can ever do in an interview is ask a yes or no question. You know, it's that you're not going to learn anything about it, so... Oh, yeah, you got one more. Yeah, um, so you made a mention that you used really kind of pre hiring strategies that yeah. you like, uh, you know, going to work with these pages, using your employees, like, like this, you know, network. Yeah. Um, which of all the strategies that you found you like found? Well, I mean, you know, as a startup, I end up getting a lot of, um, you know, I, I tend to bring on a lot of people that are relatively green and then train them up and get them to where I want to go. I mean, it's usually the, the philosophy that I've used. So I've actually found the colleges are phenomenal. I've, I've gotten, you know, one of the, one of the universities I'm at, um, there, you know, that I went to, I went to EWU and I, uh, actually went in and, um, uh, you know, every year go out and talk to the security class every single year. And, um, they, you know, just always end up grabbing the best and brightest out of the program and trying to bring them in and grow the program that way has been a way that I've done it a lot. Um, so much so they were going to cancel the program for a year. And I said, no, let me teach it. And they said, okay. So I, I, I don't know what I'm getting into, but next year I got to teach the program. So we'll see what happens there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the one that I've, I've had the most success with. Any sort of networking or anything where you can actually meet people and inter interact with them socially, I think is the one that is always going to pay the most dividends. Cause then you, again, before they even step in the interview room, you know, you know a good deal about the person. You can actually vet them out a decent amount. So. All right. Um, oh, yeah, one more. And then I'm getting the... Yeah. You know, um, God, that's a good question. Um, usually kind of that, a lot of times the perspective of sort of assumed knowledge, like even when I think that people are dumbing things down, sometimes they really aren't, you know, that they're actually sort of that whole idea of, and particularly for, um, you know, a lot of our, we have, we have a ton of clients that are, you know, just, uh, you know, we, we deal with small, like one, one room kind of spots. And, you know, we deal with some of them that are pretty small and have to help them with security assessment and being able to actually explain it in layman's terms is something that really gets critical for us. I mean, even as you go up into bigger organizations, okay, well, I've got to give a presentation to the board of directors. Okay. Can I, actually explain this well enough. And sometimes I actually found that even for me, man, you know, I really wasn't explaining that as well as I thought I was, you know, until you actually get someone who's really non-technical in the room, you can get a good filter on how that actually works and if they're actually hearing things properly. Does that kind of make sense or? Yeah. Awesome. So, all right. Well, that's all I got. So, uh, you know, I'm on Twitter at Deliznia. Uh, my email addresses are up there. Feel free to ping me if any of you guys have any questions or you want to talk further. Uh, always happy to chat with you guys. So thank you very much today. Appreciate it.